The Testing and Evaluation Committee of Deep Foundations Institute presents Static Load Testing of Deep Foundation Elements, Top-Down and Bi-Directional Static Load Testing. Deep foundations are often required to support heavy structures, such as bridges, large buildings, and civil infrastructure. These foundations are hidden from view, and few people give any thought to the massive structures and feats of engineering, often under familiar cityscapes. The weight and other load requirements of these structures must be transferred to the natural subsurface geomaterials using a foundation system that is stable and economical. A proper understanding of the strength and stiffness of the underlying site-specific soil and or rock is essential. Although much of this understanding can be obtained by investigating the subsurface materials, full-scale axial load testing is often the best way to decrease uncertainty and arrive at the optimal foundation design. This presentation will provide a brief summary of the current state of the art for axial static load testing. It will show how various deep foundation elements are designed, installed, and tested. It will also show how the test data are analyzed and how the deep foundation design might change as a result of the testing. Detailed procedures and schematics can be found in ASTM D1143-D1143M-07 2013. There are many types of piles or deep foundation systems and elements and as many names for them. Some of the more common are drilled shafts, board piles, caissons, cast in situ or cast in drilled hole or CIDH piles, load bearing elements or LBEs, barrettes, slurry walls or panels, ACIP, auger cast in place piles, sometimes called continuous flight auger or CFA piles, driven pipe piles, cast in steel shell or CISS piles, wide flange piles, timber piles, and precast concrete piles, helical and Frankie piles, soil mixing, and displacement piles. Pile is used throughout this presentation to mean any of these elements. The site, the foundation, or both can be simple or complex. The engineer will create an appropriate design specific to each project. Modern geotechnical and structural engineers must balance the need for efficiency with risk management and safety. The first step in the design process is to understand the requirements of the structures to be supported by the deep foundation. Next, typically the geotechnical engineer, will analyze the properties and load carrying capacity of the various soils and rock. Such properties are normally available in the form of soil investigation reports. The engineer can obtain a wide range of additional geotechnical data from standard penetration test boring logs, cone penetrometer soundings, shear wave velocity profiles, pressure meter tests, laboratory analysis, etc. Finally, many other factors such as noise and vibration restrictions, soil types, spoils control, or site restrictions can dictate the foundation type. Once the foundation type is selected and the physical dimensions determined, capacities for working loads and nominal loads can be assigned. This may take the form of capacity plots. Depending on the project size, uncertainty, or site variability, construction technique, or aggressiveness of design or economization, a static load test may be required. The design of a test program can be as easy as specifying a single test pile that is similar to the production piles on a small and uniform site, a so-called representative test pile. Or a more complex test program may be required utilizing multiple tests and test pile types in varying configurations. The detailed pros and cons of each program type are beyond the scope of this video. A specific or single load test may be intended to verify the design service or factored load, a so-called proof 
or verification load test. However, the engineer may require that the ultimate capacity be revealed either in end bearing or side shear or both. This requirement will usually mean heavier loads and more complex test configurations may be needed. Once the number and type of test piles are determined and the program designed, the desired data and specific suite of instrumentation appropriate for each pile are determined. For example, strain gauges can help to isolate separate unit side shear values for distinct subsurface zones. The data can be used to produce TZ and QZ curves and to refine design calculations for the entire site through various boring logs. In the case of cast in situ piles, cross hole sonic logging testing using pre installed access tubes can detect defects or anomalies in the pile concrete. Thermal integrity profile sensors are also sometimes used to detect these defects or anomalies in these kinds of piles. Compression, telltale piping, and telltales can isolate compression or differential displacements within the pile. A successful load test starts with a well-conceived assembly plan. The quality of the data depends on all the instrumentation functioning properly and being aligned or installed as intended. For example, strain gauges should be spaced equally around the cage at distinct locations and aligned along the vertical axis of the foundation element. All gauges, instrumentation, and piping should be installed as per appropriate ASTM standard or manufacturer recommendations. Gauges, thermal sensors, and piping should be secured so alignment is maintained during installation and no damage occurs. Extra care and modified procedures may be required for driven piles or ACIP piles. Common types of instrumentation and piping may include sister bar or weld on strain gauges, extensometers or embedded compression devices, telltale casings, typically half inch, 12 millimeter, or three quarter inch, 19 millimeter steel piping, cross hole sonic logging or gamma gamma piping, typically two inch, 50 millimeter steel or PVC. Fixed thermistor strings for thermal integrity profiling or axis piping for retrievable thermal probes. Some instrumentation and structural components are unique to bi-directional load testing. A single bi-directional jack or multiple jacks on one or more levels. Expansion transducers to measure expansion of the loading assemblies. A funnel to assist in guiding the tremie pipe through or around assemblies. Such stiffeners as are required to assist during cage assembly lifting. Many types of foundation elements require many different installation methods. It is important to understand and note these methods for design and testing analysis because the type of foundation and the quality and type of its construction or installation can have a dramatic effect on capacity. Construction, installation, and preparation can be very different for driven piles and other more exotic piles than for traditional board piles or drilled shafts. Board piles can be excavated and concreted in several different ways. Typically, rebar cages are installed prior to concreting. The simplest technique involves drilling the hole dry, no water added, with no casing. Groundwater may or may not be encountered. In cases where groundwater is encountered, a casing may be used only to seal the excavation from water so it remains dry. If more complex soil stabilization schemes are needed, casings may be used at the surface or all the way to the pile tip. They can be vibrated, driven, rotated in, or set into place by pre-drilling. 
various slurry types and methods can be employed. Examples are bentonite or polymer, water, and natural slurry. A head of fluid may or may not be utilized. Material is broken and or removed by augers, barrels, core barrels, spherical grabs, rock coring bits, drop chisels, and more. Tip cleaning is generally done with a cleaning bucket, or one eye, or airlift device, but occasionally with augers or by other methods. Concrete is delivered to the open excavation by flexible or rigid pipe in dry conditions using a hopper or pump truck. Local codes specify when and where these methods are appropriate. In wet excavations, concrete is delivered through rigid pipes or tremie pipes using a hopper, funnel, or pump truck. Pipe diameters are generally between 5 inches, 125 millimeters, and 12 inches, 300 millimeters. Various methods are required for these more complex installation procedures. Local codes specify techniques in some detail. LBEs are excavated by hydromill or rectangular grabs. Although other slurry methods are used, bentonite is the most common. Like drilled shafts, LBEs typically utilize rebar cages as steel reinforcement. Concrete is delivered wet into the excavation, sometimes with multiple tremie pipes, after rebar installation. Guide walls are commonly constructed in lieu of casings. ACIP, or auger cast piles, and CFA piles, continuous flight auger piles, are constructed with a continuous flight auger. Grout is pumped through the auger stem as it is removed from the excavation. A single rebar or cage, along with any instrumentation or bi-directional jacks and piping, are then plunged into the wet grout. ACIP piles are constructed with a continuous flight auger. Grout is pumped through the auger stem as it is removed from the excavation. Once the foundation element is installed and the concrete is sufficiently hardened, or in the case of driven piles, the pile has acquired enough setup, the top can be prepared. Top loaded piles require more top or head preparation than do bi-directional piles or shafts. If the top load is to be a downward compression load, as opposed to an upward tension load, rebar or other reinforcement needs to be removed or modified, and the pile top made level and adapted to accept the surfaces of the plates and jacks or load cells that will be placed between it and the reaction, typically a loading beam or kentledge. Tension tests may require more complex tension bars and other mechanisms to allow the loading systems to pull the pile up. Similar mechanisms are required for the reaction piles in a compression top-down test. The details of these are beyond the scope of this video. Steel shims and other devices are used to ensure the inline loading and load sensing system are properly installed in between the pile and reaction. Care must also be taken to ensure the reaction piles or other reaction are sufficient to withstand the applied test load safely. ASTM D1143-2013, Section 6.1.6 .6 reads, A qualified engineer shall design and approve all loading apparatus, loaded members, support frames, and loading procedures. The test beams, load platforms, and support structures shall have sufficient size, strength, and stiffness to prevent excessive deflection and instability up to the maximum anticipated test load. Under loading, the pile will experience strain, compression, and head displacement. Compression is most commonly measured with telltales or X tensometers. Typically, small pipes are installed vertically in the pile the whole length or to discrete elevations. Small rods, called telltale rods, are inserted into the piping. 
Gauges are employed to monitor the rod movement. Multiple gauge types and setups are possible. The most common setups are mirror and retracting stem gauge and inline direct rod to gauge configurations. Mirror configurations typically feature retracting rod or pin type gauges set with their bases on the pile top so the sensor stem rests perpendicularly on a mirror connected to the rod top. This allows the pile or stem to move laterally somewhat and allows a visual verification of perpendicularity. The mirror also provides a very smooth and flat surface. The inline configuration consists of a transducer specifically designed to be attached directly to the rod and a mechanism to attach the gauge to the piping so the gauge and rod are in line with no angular kinks or bends. This type of setup eliminates most of the error associated with lateral movements and non-perpendicularity, the so-called cosine error. Top of pile movement is one of the most difficult things to measure during a load test, especially for long duration load tests. This is due to many factors, such as pile size and location, site activity, and environmental factors. The most common types of devices are optical levels or survey instruments, wire lines, and reference beams with attached displacement transducers. Optical levels are capable of measuring top of pile displacement from the greatest distances. The system could be as simple as a basic survey level focused on a ruler on the top of pile. Or, sophisticated digital levels may be employed to read targets to as much as a thousandth of an inch accuracy or better. Older methods, still reliable and in use, utilize reference beams and displacement transducers. Often the transducers are the same as, or very similar to, those used to measure compression. Stem type transducers are affixed to the beam with the stem resting on a perpendicular mirror. The mirror is in turn attached to the pile top. Some other, older methods such as wire lines are less common today, but can still be seen in use, typically as backups to the primary top of pile measurements. Having instrumented the pile top and interior of the pile where applicable, there are several ways to collect data. Using ASTM D1143, similar standards or local codes, one can decide on the frequency and type of data collected and how the loading shall be applied and removed. Sometimes technicians manually record various gauge readings. This is done even when electronic gauges are used with the aid of readout boxes. However, an automatic data recorder or data logger is preferable. Using data loggers, the technician or engineer can log data quickly, accurately, and at regular intervals. It is most common to log each and every gauge's data every 10 to 120 seconds during a static load test. Data loggers not only allow more gauges to be read more often, they also provide critical data backup. Modern test piles can have a dizzying amount of instrumentation. Large diameter piles may have over 50 strain gauges. Adding to this, compression, expansion if applicable, top of pile and extensometer gauges, a data logger may monitor over 100 individual gauges. Ideally, all these data are sent to a laptop computer to be organized and displayed. This modern setup allows a clear presentation of real-time data for the benefit of on-site decision makers. When manual readings are taken, it is recommended that the engineer plot key data, such as load movement curves, on paper at a minimum. Presentation of real-time data can vary widely. If all data are organized and displayed on a computer, many combinations of data and analysis are possible. Simple load movement curves are most common.
Once all the data are collected and analyzed, a report is produced. The report is the purpose and value of the whole enterprise, and its quality is critical. The engineer is now armed with all the load test data. There are many ways the data are used, and even more reasons why. There are even cases when the data are not used at all. Perhaps the test was a confirmation test or proof test, and either not enough data were obtained to redesign the piles, or such a redesign is not possible on the project due to budget and time constraints or by specification. In many cases, however, the subsurface reveals its carrying capacity and a redesign is not only allowed, but aggressively pursued. Depending on how early the testing is done, lateral and seismic concerns, and structural or geometric limitations, the piles may be shortened or lengthened. The cross-sectional area may also be altered. For example, a drilled shaft diameter may be decreased, or a smaller H-pile might be used, etc. These changes can be justified by changing target ultimate capacities and associated allowable loads or fee factors, or factors of safety, as a result of the testing. Installation equipment and technique can also be shown to affect capacities and thus dimensions. To do a proper design and redesign, the engineer will likely have multiple boring logs and other geotechnical data in hand. These data, which were used to produce the original design in most cases, can now be reanalyzed. Often, additional borings are collected during this phase of the project. The load test data can be used along with all the geotechnical data to calibrate or improve the capacity plots or other estimates of foundation performance so that their results can be applied to similar materials across the site. The Testing and Evaluation Committee of Deep Foundations Institute thanks you for watching this video on static load testing of deep foundation elements, top-down and bi-directional static load testing. The contents of this video are meant for general information only. Please consult an experienced engineer, ASTM D1143-2013, U.S. Department of Transportation's FHWA's Applicable Design and Construction Manuals, and Local Codes and Standards for more details.